Thank you for tuning in. I'm excited to host and announce this video where we discuss and announce the next Circling and Dialogos weekend training. That's February 19th and 20th, that's a Saturday and Sunday, 10 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. on both Saturday and Sunday, and that's Pacific Standard Time. There is a discount if you sign up two weeks before the course starts, which is February 6th. The link to register is in the show notes below. So if you have been listening in on the conversations that I've been having with John and Chris and all the other people, um, and you feel inspired by the ideas that we discuss and connect with the distinctions, this course is going to be about experiencing those things and diving deep into the very practices of mindfulness, contemplation, philosophical meditation and inquiry, inner subjective meditation or circling, and dial like the actual practice doing philosophical dialectic. The first one that we did was just really exceeded all of our expectations and we had so much fun doing it. It was so inspiring and the people that showed up for it were just, were just good. They were awesome. And so we were inspired to, to keep going and keep refining it. So this one, Chris, John and I are going to refine it, deepen it. And we hope to see you February, February 19th and 20th, 10 a.m to 3.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Links to register are below, and I hope to see you there. Enjoy this video. So I'm super, 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 super excited to announce the next Dialogos Encircling course. It'll be our second one. And the first one, I think, really exceeded our expectations. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just wanted to take, take some time and we'll be doing a, a number of different videos and stuff talking in, in more detail and probably do like a question and answer video, those kinds of things. But mostly I just wanted to, for us to get together and, and essentially announce the next course, um, let people know where it is, um, and then say a few words of like why we're doing it, what the course is for, um, mm -hmm. where we see this, this is going, um, and what it's addressing. So I would just say that I, I, you know, as I'm saying this sentence right now, I'm just present to the, um, how much, how, how much this has been emergent out of mm -hmm. a community of people, right? that has, we've been circling around something and having mm -hmm. conversations. Um, and the conversations on some level have been revealing what we're circling around. And mm -hmm. one of the things that we started noticing was that, that there was this intimate relationship between um, uh, how we circled around it and how it showed itself to us. Yes. And, and that precisely were, like realized and recognized that actually on one level, we, we stumbled on to something new from a certain perspective, but really something really, really ancient that goes back to the very, very beginnings of philosophy and Plato and Socrates. So I'm really, really excited to uh, what, what we're doing together here. Yeah, I am too. Um, so, um, I, I've been. Did, I I tried to take time off, and I managed to a little bit over the December break. But um, the, the the flurry of uh, of discussions have, have just uh, picked up again. Um, and what seems to be shared among a lot of these discussions, people talking about there. There's a sense of imminence that things are were were, were, were there's like a uh, something's in the air, something's changing. Um, and so for me. It's it's it, yeah it's 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 like you said, guy. It goes back to Socrates, 
but it, it comes right to this pivot point that I think we're on. Um, and one way, one way I, I, I've been talking about it recently um, is to challenge um, a, a sort of set way of seeing and speaking. And the problem when you, when you have a set way of saying and speaking is you, you don't, it, it, it so filters the world that you can't get any evidence of alternative ways of seeing and speaking. Uh, and it becomes almost self-evident that there is only this way. And the problem for many people today is that the, the only way that seems to be available is the one that seems to um, commit them to choosing between despair and uh, avarice or something noxious like that. Um, and many people are, 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 are like we're seeing major moves that people are rejecting that the fact that people are not going back to work after covid uh, well after covid <laughs> uh, but anyways right um and one of the ways i'd like to put it uh, just to bring up uh, it, and I'll, I'll, I'll try not to use too many large words multisyllabic words but um paul ricoeur talked about the fact that we were launched into what he called the hermeneutics of suspicion this was given to us by freud and marx and nietzsche and we could we could amend that and add derrida who was contemporary with Ricoeur. Um, and the hermeneutics of, of suspicion takes as its exemplary moment of truth, the moment when we uncover the conspiracy, when we reveal the secret motive, when we uncover the malicious agenda, right? Uh, and this is, the, this is the moment of truth. And this is taken as uh, the measure uh, and the, pro the measure of, uh, of how we are supposed to ultimately frame reality. Now that's the problem with the hermeneutics of suspicion is twofold. One is it breeds distrust of the world, of other people, of oneself, yeah. and it breeds cynicism and ultimately nihilism. Yeah. Now, but people might say, but it might be true, but the problem is it can't ultimately be ultimate. The, the point that many philosophers, Marlo Ponty, Heidegger, uh, Hegel, right, is you can only realize one thing's an illusion in contrast to another experience that you take to be real. Yeah. You can only realize that you've been self-deceived in a moment of self-correction, right? Yeah. You can only realize that you've been limited when you transcend that limit. There's multiple ways. Philosophers keep converging on this point. We can't take illusion as the ultimate taste of realness. Yeah. And what I want, and now to get to the point, what I'm, propo what I'm proposing, right, is to see Dialogos as challenging the hermeneutics of suspicion in a profound way, mm. right? Now, notice the hermeneutics of suspicion has fallen prey to the very thing it was designed to uh, attack. The whole point of the hermeneutics of suspicion was to get us to call into question default assumptions about reality. But now the hermeneutics of suspicion has become the default assumption, and it has become pre precisely noxious Yeah, in that way. Now, with dialogos, you have the alternative. You say, no, no, any disclosure of deception, of illusion is ultimately based on a more primordial and profound disclosure of a contact with realness. Yeah. And then, then the exemplary moment of truth isn't the discovery of the secret cabal. Yeah. It's the moment of the co-emergence of shareable and shared insight. It's the hermeneutics of beauty. Look, yeah. in the hermeneutics of suspicion, appearances deceive us and distract us and distort us from reality. Yeah. yeah. But in the hermeneutics of beauty, appearances disclose the depths of reality and beauty invites us towards truth and towards goodness. Yeah. And the point is that we're the hermeneutics of suspicion, while it's pretending to be foundational, is actually deeply parasitic upon this the hermeneutics yes. of beauty. And Dialogos gets us to re-remember, re-experience, relive this, reappropriate it so that we can challenge fundamentally the yes. hermeneutics of suspicion. What if you could taste a way of seeing and being with yourself and other people that what gave you a sense of the capacity to trust yourself and other people and reality in a deservedly rational fashion. I think that this is, the, for me, more yes. and more what I think the key of Dialogos is, that what it's doing is challenging this fundamental orientation we have in our culture that is destroying us right. and showing it, like disclosing it 
but in a beautiful way, right? That it isn't yeah. the only way we have to be. Yes. And so for me, uh, Dialogos, it, like, and, and this sounds like, like, oh, abstract, but the point is, it goes right down into, you know, like we, we take you through a series of practices in which this becomes viable, present, practicable by you. That's why I think Dialogos is so important. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Very nice. Absolutely. It's funny because eh? it, part of part of why Dialogos is able to do that is because it changes. Um, it kind of it takes our attention and and basically multiplies the way in which our current frame of attention becomes consequential to how we think in the first place, mm -hmm. right? And it sort of reverse engineers a different way of paying attention by, I think, essentially um, almost dilating the scope of consequence that comes with thinking in a certain manner, right? Mm. It's sort of like we are tested in a way. Um, and the point of Dialogos isn't sort of to test your metal or to test your intellect or anything like that, but it is, I think, a test of how your attention is sharpened or not sharpened yeah. and where it yeah. seeks to go automatically mm, and instinctively, yes. right? Yes. That's yes. one of the things that you find out in dialogue is you find out where you, where you tend, mm. right? That, that, that quote, I can't remember whose it is, John, but you like to repeat it often of uh, Socrates taught me how to talk to myself. Who, who, oh, oh, Antisthenes. What did Antisthenes. you learn? From, Antisthenes. What did you learn from Socrates? I learned how to dialogue with myself. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. And so that's a huge part of it, that the relatedness of dialogue and the relatedness oh. of dialogos reverses itself back into the interior, just as it does between yes. persons. Right. And so it's yes. it's an exercise yes. in how to better keep our own company by yes. knowing by knowing how to direct our attention within yes. our own company, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And marshal our attention, right? I think right. of like that persistent platonic metaphor of the chariots and the, yeah. the pilot of the chariots and the cohering of the different forces, the different loves. And, and, and Dialogos, I think, is a, it's among other things, it's a kind of way of arranging those loves so that the attention is paid to the yeah. highest possible yeah. order within the scope or within the context that's given by the moment, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's it's really just e it's it's even in the word philosophy, philia, Sophia, philia yes. being yes. the love, the love and intimacy of fellowship, right? Of of community, of 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 friendship in the deepest sense of the word, and Sophia, wisdom, and mm -hmm. I think they from the very beginning, philia, Sophia, they go together. And yes, and uh, this is the thing that I I, I want to emphasize, and I, I don't think we can we can emphasize this enough because a lot of times people think about something like philosophy and they think academics, they think kind of abstractions, those kinds of things. But actually, you know, back to the point, well, the point both of you were were, were getting at. Actually, what we're talking about to that it's possible to be in relationships with people and to commune together in such a way where we don't just sustain or idle together, but we actually can disclose more of reality, right? In mm -hmm. the very way mm -hmm. that we relate. Um, in this, this, this uh, in the deepest sense, this deep intimacy between relationship, right? And being oriented in relationship and to really kind of understanding to, to, to such a profound degree what we are as human beings is so deeply relational through and through that, of course, the way that we relate with one another, right, can be, right, ones in which we're not just apes, like, like kind of being able to get like, you'll pick, you know, you'll pick leaves off my back, but, but actually to relate with one another such that more of reality comes to bear upon us in, in deep transforming ways. And, and I think it's an, it seems to be innate to, to the possibility of what relationship is. Right. And that's the, that's the thing that a lot of, of this, of this, um, what, what had us come together and do this course is seeing this interconnection between friendship and basically deep, profound conversations, 
right? This, this yes. way where they mutually disclose one another and deepen one another. Um, and so me having, having started circling back in 1998, which is essentially a relational practice, um, we were like, well, that's really getting at this philea part of it. And, mm-hmm. But there's also deep, there's also naturally, it discloses in these kind of trans, these, these transcendent kinds of experiences, right? That seem to go together. And so we did our first one a number of months ago. And it's so like when we did the circling and the personal intimacy and all of that right at the beginning, it's so mm-hmm. beautifully turned into the philosophical conversation, the conversation for wisdom. I just thought it was, I mean, it was really, it, it was really stunning. Yeah, I, I, I think, I mean, what Theologos does is it retutors you, not in thought, but in attention and perception yeah. uh, about that, that, you know, persons are, they, they're especially disclosing of being, of reality, because they're, they're kind of the apex of being and then and then an aperture into its depth an apex aperture because yeah. right uh, the, the we rep human persons represent sort of actualizations of reality that ha- that give us access to how we see everything else right it, it's it, i mean and, and and that can go from something very i don't know what what adjective primitive to a kind of animism or an anthropomorphism to a profound realization like that, no, no, no. If we really plumb the depths of how we make sense together, we are always conjoined to plumbing yeah. the depths of how reality discloses yeah. itself yeah. to us. Yeah. And, and and I put it to you that one of the things we're all hungering for, above and beyond the particular hungers and angers that we have right now, is we're hungering for a contact. And 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 it's it's this. Yes. It's this stereoscopic contact. We want more contact with other people and we, more, and we want more contact with what's real. And, and we want those two together. Yeah. And what Theologos does is it brings those two together. The philia is we start to get people, they, all, they almost universally say they just rediscover a kind of intimacy that's neither sexual intimacy, nor, nor just companionship, nor economic interdependence. It's this more primordial kind of intimacy, the fellowship, the philia, that contact with others. And then they start to, especially when, when we do the course, is they start to recover through that intimacy with others, and then through the others and intimacy with themselves, they start to recover a capacity for an intimacy with yeah. reality, a sense of being really connected. And I don't mean some abstract philosophical construct in the academic sense. I mean that lived sense of being almost like in vibrational resonance with reality so that you feel like you fundamentally belong in existence again. And for me, uh, Dialogos really helps people articulate in, in, in both senses of the word, this longing they have and allows them not only to come to an awareness of the longing, but get it articulated so they can start addressing it. Uh-huh. Like people start to, they both, they both, the, the hunger goes from being incohate to more cohate. And then they, through that, they start to get a better sense of how that hunger can be satisfied. Um, and, and, and then they practice the, this, you know, the beginning of the, 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 the transformation of skills and virtues that will allow them to do that. And so I like, Again, I, I, I mean, this is, this is, I'm not trying to blow smoke here. I, I, I think Dialogos is pivotal right now. Um, and, and it's pivotal at multiple levels. It's pivotal in, your, in our individual lives that are beset. It's pivotal in how we are connecting in our interpersonal you know, communities. But it's also pivotal on how the culture as a whole is relating to the world and to reality and to other cultures. Um, and so at multiple levels, right, you can use this just in a very personal process and you'll get a lot out of it, but you can also, it promises, it's pregnant with the power to address these deeper levels that many of us are concerned with and that, and and we're finding it harder and harder to separate off the way we were taught the private life from the public life, because they're interfering with each other in a more and more pronounced fashion. 
And Dialogos gives you the capacity to address the personal to right to 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 the biggest picture. Yeah. Yeah. And in that that way, and I think the practice, right? So p- part of the part of what we're talking about. So most of the course is going to be it's it's not it's not going to be very much like lecture. No. Almost none. Most yeah. of it is just setting context, right? To go into to to engage into practices, right? Yeah. And in the practices, you could say, and using some of John's language, you could say it puts constraints around a certain set of like meaning machinery, right? Communication, mm-hmm. like uh, 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 embodiment experiences, ways to perspectives to sit in. And what any kind of skill building or capacity deepening practice always involves putting a constraint around the thing that you want to work on so that you, so that you don't default into what you would normally do, but you're forced to stay and work a particular muscle. Right. So, so this is, so, so this whole course is really basically we're only going to do as much talking as it takes to, to understand what you're going to, to be able to participate fully in the exercise and then come out and talk about the insights that, that came through that. But these are this. And, and I think maybe we want to talk a little bit about this because I first heard the words, John, you first used these in your um, uh, uh, meaning crisis series Awakening from the Meaning Suck Crisis Series, this idea of an ecology of practices. Yes. Right? Yeah. And this is, I think, in this course, this really is one of the places where that sense of an ecology of practice literally comes to fl- fruition here, because it yeah. really is creating an ecology and specific layers of practices that build and mutually feed on each other, right, in a, in a, in a big way. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a pedagogical program in which you'll be sort of introduced to some meditative skills and then some contemplative skills and then some circling skills and then uh, right what's called philosophical fellowship skills and then we move into a practice called dialectic and all of these practices layer on and they afford each other and they constrain each other and they feed back into each other. Chris, what did you want to say? Yeah, I think I kind of think of it as like the, the different practices that that lead into dialectic and the dialogos are sort of like sketching out dimensions of a geometric figure. Mm-hmm. And right, you can think of it as a kind of collider for attention or a collider for uh, for your loves, right? That yeah. into which yeah. you place them yeah. and the different practices beginning with with circling and the the meditative and contemplative practices that you lead john basically are unfolding the dimensions of that figure so that by the time we're ready to actually step into that figure and fill it with our attention there's actually a, a shape there's a figure there to actually help to vector things in a certain direction so that they're not simply chaotic or or scattershot in the way that they often are right so there's a form to guide the content that we bring to it and that the form is designed to, to be transformative, just as it were, a, you know, just as it were a physical collider or something like something used in, in, in the sciences. That, that, that's important. And it's important to also note um, that this is still very much a work in progress. Yes. So this is simultaneously a workshop, but it is also a, a, a lived experiment. Uh, we are probably going to put some modifications on what we did in the first workshop, given uh, so a lot of the conversations and reflections we've had from the first workshop into this second workshop. And, um, and, and, and so you will actually not only participate in something um, that's transformative, you will also help to participate in something that could be transforming the very pedagogical program itself and helping us to improve it for other people. Um, and so there's, there's, there's that richer purpose to it as well. Um, and, and we very much, uh, I, I, you know, the three of us, uh, and Chris and I are, are talking uh, a lot about some things and about bringing, um, some other aspects in, uh, to, uh, the pedagogy. And there's a few things where I think we'll tweak in and yep. just do yep. some initial tries this time around it. Um, and so, I, I w- I, so not only are we offering this course, 
in a very deep sense, we're requesting your participation uh, because you are helping us to experiment and engineer and improve and make something better that is still very much understood to be a work in progress. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's key. But thanks. Yeah, I'm glad you. I'm glad you brought that up, John. I think that's key. Absolutely. Yeah. The the. You know the the sense is you know it's also too with the ecology of practices. So part of you know part of my understanding of what that points to is you know, that, that there are, there's spiritual traditions, right. That have out of them have created like things like meditation and all kind of yoga, all kinds of different ways mm -hmm. of, um, working the, the, the machinery, machinery of self-transcendence. Right. And one of the things about that machinery is that, um, it, that same machinery, we talk about this a lot, where that same machinery that, can, that can, can open you to enlightenment, right, is also the very same machinery that can, can turn in on you, right? Oh, very much. And go yeah. south, right? And my, my sense about it is that because that human beings, we are comported in the world the way that we are, right? It's not like it's not like all of your meaning making capacities and your meaning experiences capacities. It's not like if you don't use them that the, they just kind of sit there, right? I think actually if we don't exercise all of our um, abilities and capacities for self transcendence, if we don't consciously address those and take those up and develop them in our lives, they actually go sour. Right. They actually turn oh, yeah. into things like it, addictions. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. it's meaning, meaning and profundity and self-transcendence are that's not those aren't options for us. When no, those no. are find, yeah. Yeah. They find they find they find their if if they're not directed properly, they find their resting place. They find their home in lesser objects. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And, and this, lesser re and lesser realities. This is a Socratic and Platonic insight. This is right there. I mean, and there's books of the Republic just dedicated to the fact if you're not pursuing it, like wisdom is not optional. And in that sense, philosophia is not yeah. optional. Yeah. Right. You're either doing it explicitly or you're doing it implicitly. And if you're doing it implicitly, implicitly, the chances are it's being beset by your bias and you're being manipulated by yeah. the machination of other yeah. people. Yeah. The degree to which you're ignorant of something is the degree to which you're imprisoned into it. Yes. Right. And, right. And, yes. and it, and, and guys point and Chris's point is it doesn't just sit there sort of latent. It, it, it is a dynamic self-organizing capacity within you and it will evolve. And yeah. you, you have yeah. to, you like, this is the Socratic, even Kierkegaardian point, right? You have to bear yeah. the responsibility for that. You cannot avoid that responsibility. You can pretend that you're not responsible. You can distract yourself, but it's not optional. And, and, and we're sort of realizing that. I mean, one of the things that COVID has done is thrown us back onto the fact that, right, things don't stay still in meaning making. Like they, 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 they either are cultured by wisdom oriented practices or 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 they the, the, the capacity for self-transformation produces monsters and there's an increasing monstrosity in the meaning making domains of our society and to think that your mind our minds I include ourselves are not infected and affected by this I think it is it is it, just unjustifiable yeah, um, that's right what did that's you want right. to say Chris that's right no no it, that's yeah that's exactly it. And, and when it's working properly, dialogue, what Delos is intended to do in part is to lend consciousness to the implicit despair in the Kierkegaardian language or the implicit lack um, that, that we, we find ourselves in, whether we're conscious of or not. And, yeah. and I like that. I like that you, that's, boy, that point goes undersung very, very often. Yeah. This idea that it is not an option. We can't opt out of it. If we're not, just because we're not conscious of it doesn't mean that it's not happening to us. Yeah. And so this is a, this is a mechanism to gain, to yeah. gain consciousness and to lend it to others, right. To basically use yeah. the social context yes. to create and borrow and share reciprocally a consciousness that can be then reintrojected to one's own That's beautiful. sensibility. 
that's Dialogos in a sentence, what he just said, that, that sharing out of consciousness and that sharing in where consciousness isn't some Cartesian thing, but this active process of in, trying to engage and connect to yourself and connect to the world. That was beautiful, Chris. That's exactly. And Dialogos is, right, this whole program of dialectic into Dialogos, this pedagogical program, it's designed to give you, right, this, 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 uh, this living, right, ecology of practices, a scaffolding, one skill prepares you for the next, they layer on each other so that you, you don't have to just listen, don't listen to our words ultimately, come and do the practice and taste what it can give you. Yeah, yeah. yes, yes. And one of the things about what's, I mean, I, the more I look at it, the more, the, the more astonished I am at the time that we're in, the unprecedented time that we're in, in terms of technology, in terms of like the time scales that we're looking at, how much change is happening. Uh, there's, it's, it's, it's extraordinary to, to the degree that we are in a time that it has never been before quite in the way that it is now. And, and what we're facing with that. And, and part of, you could say, the self-transcendence and the relational practices have usually been historically has been, been in the domain of religion. Yes. And it's, and, and, and now that's not, that's not viable for many people, right. In our, in our time. Right. So in some sense, part of the, the, one of the things I really like about the, the idea of an ecology of practices is that, in some sense, it's taking up a lot of the wisdom of these religions, um, but in such a way that you don't you don't have to buy into a whole set of beliefs, right? You don't have to. It's not. It's there's uh, there's not a dogma. There's not like a, something that you have to believe. It's more about how to more profoundly relate to reality, right? And and that goes beyond, way beyond propositional knowing, way beyond beliefs. So that's one of the things I really like about this in some senses, like these practices are, a lot of them are very, very ancient, right? Dialectic is, that goes all the way back, you know, in 2,500 years ago, right? We, in the Platonic Academy, Socrates asking these Socratic questions and have people having catharsis and going into aporia and and this 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 kind of this kind of grappling to disclose more and more of of and in in and to be struck by how much we don't know, right? And the the wisdom that's afforded through that. So there's a sense where I what I like about what it is that we're doing with this is it's in some sense I've noticed this with um, with the years of circling is you know, it's the practices on one level, like we're going to be doing explicit things about, right, about actually having genuine philosophical dialogues in a structured way, right? It, it, in, mm -hmm. And there's a, and there, there's a certain formality that we will go through with that in order to really highlight the, and, and exercise those particular skills. And in some sense, those capacities and what I've noticed is the same thing with, with circling is that, you know, when you're, if you're, if you're at, for example, if you're, if, if, if you go to yoga class and you're doing a down, downward dog, right. And you start to get really, really good at downward dog and you struggle with it. Why you do yoga probably isn't to do downward dog, right? You're doing downward dog and yoga so that when you're walking out in your life and you're not thinking about yoga, your relationship with gravity, with movement, with the whole is more attuned it, and it's pre-reflective. It gets, that's the practice is that your response, right? Is more open, those kinds of things. And one of the things that I think is really, um, I think because it's so close to us, uh, it's, it's, it's also the most hidden to us that, that really we become as human beings through conversation. Like we all become through these, like I become who I am through my dwelling in the attention and the conversations of my parents and my family and my culture. And, 
that there's actually, there's a structure to those conversations, right? That actually have a deep effect about who we are. And I think that goes on for our, our whole lives, but there's very little attention in my view, given how, given how deeply influential it is for us and, and how deeply impactful conversations are, um, very little attention is paid to the form of engagement, the form of communication, the form of dialogue with an understanding, especially with the understanding that there's, there's a way that we can dialogue that can actually emphasize and be open to the kind of changes and growth that we wanna have. And that's one of the things that really, really, really excites me about, about Dialogos and what we're doing here. I, yes. I think that's well said. And that goes back to Antisthenes. You're, you're, you're having conversations all day long, even when you're alone. Yes. And, and, and think, about, think about what would happen if I took away from any of us the, conversation to, the ability to have conversations with others or even with yourself. Yeah. Think about how radically your agency would, would be reduced and how impoverished your experience would be and your sense of identity. And yet, as Guy pointed out, this fundamental machinery of cognition and agency is largely left to just run of its own accord. Like we, 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 we think we should be educated on other things, but we think that this is just something we can just do. And, and, and the problem with that, in one sense, that's true. We can just do it. But in another sense, that blinds us to the fact that we could do it so much better. Yeah. Evil doesn't come into the world by people choosing evil. They choose a lesser good in place of a greater good. And if yeah. we constantly just default to, well, we'll just sort of chit chat along. Right. Um, and that's, the, and then we, that, that, that actually shapes right, our identities and the, the fabric of our, of our mind. Like think about how, how, how much, how much we're wasting uh, and what opportunity we're wasting. I would say that that primordiality, um, I, want, I, want to, I want to respond to something that Guy said. I do agree that um, Dialogos is very much for people who find the traditional religions non-viable for many different reasons, right? On the other hand, I would say, and this is also true, Dialogos often helps return people yes. to a religion and yeah. find a home within yeah. it that they were in question about or that was not properly uh, making them feel homed. Yes. And so Dialogos is not something that is like, it's not designed to convert you in or out of a religion. It's designed to reinforce your capacity for religio, for connectedness. Yes. And insofar as you might not find any traditional religion, a viable home for religio, Dialogos will help you. But insofar as you have a religion that homes religio, dialogos will also help you. And third thing, it will allow the non-believers and the believers to commune and fellowship with each other, which is sorely needed today as well. Big time. Good, good. Big yeah, time. yeah, it's critical. That's critical. Because it's not, it, dialogos isn't out to change what you know or what you believe. It's the how you know and how you believe that it's out to change. Right, the fundamental attitude of participation, the dispositional, formal way of relating, writ large, relating. Period. And um, I mean, I think of one way of thinking about it when we talk about the voices, the conversations that carry on unnoticed inside of us. We, we mm. like they're not just conversations; they are the forces that direct our will and attention yes. and agent. Right. They're working on us. They're directing our movements. They're steering us, whether we're conscious of being steered by them or not. Yeah. And so one thing that, again, when it's working properly, one thing that Dialogos does is that we use the logos within Dialogos as the voice to tame our multitudes and yes. to hear them. Yes. yes. Right. Yeah. So that there's a consciousness that that those that the the multivocal nature of ourselves and our personalities can be given something like an orchestral conductor to, to help to, to, to bring it into yeah. accordance, right? The, the interpersonal and the intrapersonal, they re reflect and reinforce and disclose and articulate each other 
when di dialectic into dialogos is 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 happening. Right. Exactly. exactly. So it, dialogos wants to give you back to yourself, right? It wants to orient you back to yourself, and and that's why it can be. I I think I think I think we've seen enough to know that it. I mean, just within our experience, you know, yeah. not least the tradition that it's emerging from, that um, in the way that Platonism was so essential to the emergence and the ontology of Christianity and the relatedness of its fundamental hypostatic, right? The, the, yeah. the, 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 the Trinitarian relatedness that came out of it obviously rests on that tradition. And in the same way that one emerged from the other, I think so too can a renewal of religious participation emerge from the profound experience of being in dialogic practice it's not a certainty and you know that's a that's a big statement like it's let's say that cautiously but i think there's enough there's enough evidence for the fact that you know that that's possible well, well look at how the dialectical tradition the platonic neoplatonic tradition neoplatonism platonism neoplatonism enter into re reciprocal reconstruction with christianity like you yeah. just said but they also do this with Islam and produce Sufism. They do it with Judaism and produce Kabbalah. They do it with Cartesian, the, the Cartesian framework in Spinoza and produce Spinoza's, right? And, 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 and they, they Neoplatonism can enter in, enter into a reciprocal reconstruction with a scientific revolution. That's what happened at the beginning of the 20th century. Like so, it, it like it, again, we're we're what we're trying to help. Right, what, what we're trying to help do is to recover this lingua franca arena in which reciprocal reconstruction, like I'm reading Thomas Plant's book right now, where he's comparing pseudo Dionysus uh, to, 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 to pure land Buddhism and how yeah. this kind of platonic framework bound the Silk Road together. And it didn't make everybody say the same thing, but it provided a space in which everybody could talk in a way that was mutually transformative and they could commune even when they could disagree. And that allowed them to trade and build civilizations together. This is, this is again, right? I, I, that I, I, I'm just, I think I'm, I'm trying to broaden the historical argument that Chris is making, right? The, 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 what we're trying to get at is and I mean this with respect. We're trying to get at the space from which religions are born, so that the so people can go back if they need to, or they can give birth to something that is, you know, trans-religious or post-religious that will do that same thing for them. But also, as I said, afford people to talk to each other again. Like it's amazing how we're we are losing. Like, given what Guy said, think about how fundamental conversation is. And what we are losing right now is the ability to properly converse with each other. Yeah. Like yeah. we're talking about, we talk about the environment being degraded and we should, by the way, but the, the very environment that makes persons possible, metacognitive, self-reflective, self-aware, moral agents possible, that environment is being degraded, not by any one position, but by the lack of the, the, the denuding of the forest of conversation. We right. can't have an ecology of practices. We can't even have an ecology of way of be ways of being without that. We are losing. We are losing conversation at a rapid rate, and this should be our primary concern. If you all you're concerned about is a particular position winning or losing, you are ultimately losing. We are all we are all losing together. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. I was thinking about what. I was thinking about what what are some things that are like kryptonite for nihilism, and um, <laughs> like like what is I, I, I what what is it just kind of like I, I was listening to something about how they're like some breakthroughs in, in curing cancer, something about like some of it has to do with what are the environments that cancer can't survive in, right? Different ways of eating and stuff, and so I was thinking about like what is that with nihilism. And, and I would imagine there's a bunch of things, but the one that seems really poignant to me, at least in my experience, it has to do with wonder. Like mm -hmm. yes. the, 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 the primary disposition of wonder. And, yes. and I, it almost feels to me that that, and I mean, mean that in the sense of 
the deep sense in which when you're, it's not like, not wonder is like a subjective feeling, right? No. Um, not, not wonder in terms of something being wonderful on the outside, but the disposition of wonderment, right? Where, where in some sense, what is, what is most, um, on one level, there's one sense of wonder where you look at something and it's so, it's so beautiful, it's so amazing that you experience awe and wonder. However, there's also another way where wonder is, is, is where you start to, when it becomes a disposition, is where what is most common becomes the most strange. What is most mm-hmm. common becomes the most wondrous. And that, that, that way or that focal setting, right, um, that stance, that perspective, that, that context that we come from such that we can look at the world, listen to the world, feel the world, feel ourselves in relationship to the world, that, that place where what is, what is right before us, what's closest to us, what's most immediately, what we usually call our reality, that's, that's normal or ordinary. What we're talking about is that focal setting that can see its extraordinariness, its uncanniness, its wondrous. And I think that's one of the things that I, I noticed in, in uh, when we did the first um, Dialogos a, a, a couple of months ago, is what I started to see is every time they'd go and do an exercise and, and we'd all come back, right? And they do another exercise, they come back. The sense of affinity and the sense of wonder kept, yeah. Yeah. kept yeah. expanding, kept expanding, yeah. kept expanding. Um, and I, I have a feeling that in some sense, that almost is almost like a, a direct, in, in, in my view, cultivating that. And this is, this is also what, what Socrates, I think, I think was the first one to talk about, that philosophy arises out of the disposition of wonderment. Very right? much. Very much. Yes. In that, in that sense. And I think a lot, a lot of the exercises that we're doing precisely in some sense, I, you can, you can, you can see them as practicing abiding in that focal setting such that what you're looking at, you know, because again, you know, speaking to, to the notion that a lot of times people think of philosophy as something really, really abstract, mm-hmm. but actually our, our time and our place and our relationship in this moment, if we really, really can open to it and look at it and see it, right. And, and be, and truly listen to it um, is a source of an extraordinary amount of wonderment, right. Mm-hmm. And meaning. And so it's, it's, the, it's, that's the thing I want to just emphasize what we're talking about are really, the, there's these exercises that are deeply experiential that have to do with right now, in this moment, being with you and what we're addressing is that practice of that particular focal setting, right? And I would say that that's almost, that's almost like kryptonite <laughs> to the meeting crisis, or that's like almost like kryptonite to, to nihilism. I think that that's right. I think the proper response to nihilism is to learn how to fall in love with the world again, which is yeah. properly a dialogical relationship. Like the, you, the, you and the world are reciprocally opening to each other, and you practice that wonderment, that reciprocal opening, in yeah. dialogos, uh, and you, in a way that will permeate through the levels of your consciousness and cognition, and pervade throughout the domains of your life. Um, yeah. And this is how it's different from distractive entertainment and, and and other things. Nihilism proposes a closure on what reality can be. It, provo- it proposes a conclusive, a, a conclusive closure about reality um, wow. and um, reopening the world is the best evidence that that closure is not, uh, it, 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 it is, it, it is actually not true in a profound way. And then there, if you're in a certain framework, nothing I can say to you as an argument will move you from that uh, because everything will strike you as evidence for the framework of the closure of the world. If, but if you practice, right, 
It's like, like, like if you've never been to Greece and I try to convince you to go to Greece, you'll just keep seeing it in Canadian or American terms. And why should I go to Greece? But if you can go to Greece, you'll come back and go, oh, wow, it's so different. That's right. It's, it's a similar kind of thing. But if you practice this course, you get the opening of yourself and the opening of the world to each other. Um, that is the best way of, fall, of remembering in a deep sense what it is to fall in love with, with the world. That's For me, that's the deepest meaning of truth. Yeah. The meaning of truth is, is, is not some correctness of semantic content. It's the ability to fall in love with reality um, uh, in, in a good way. I, I'm obviously thinking of the true and the good and the beautiful as being completely interdefining here. Yes. And so, yeah, I, like, again, this is, there's a move Socrates would say, like, what you, what you worship is where you spend your time and your attention. Um, and he would often ask, why are you paying so little time and attention to the care of your soul? Uh, and, and, and what you're trying to do in this course is, this course is not going to be complete or finished. It's just to introduce you to the possibility of skills you can train, virtues you can cultivate, character uh, that you can embody that will set you on a course by which like, you will, again, fall in love with being, yes. being yes. yourself, being with others, and being in the world. Uh, and, 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 and I ask you, like, uh, again, isn't it worth it? <laughs> I, I, and really, I, I mean... Uh, uh, it's it, it it it. What other way could we best spend our time, uh, yes. other than trying to help each other yes. reawaken and remember what that is like? That seems to me one of the greatest things human beings can do. And again, that's why we're not just offering this to you; we're requesting your participation because it makes possible a way of education, right, and, and improving that way of education for other people not only in this particular version of the course, but particular ver uh, future versions and other things. Dialogos is a family of practices. D dialectic into Dialogos is one, there's many. And, and the more we can get people to take this up and help each other remember, I, I, I guess it sounds pretentious, but for me, this is, this, this is where, where the pivot point that we're, we're all sensing we're on, this is how we pivot it. Uh, how we, we how we how we escape from a world that seems to be a, a, like we're 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 doing a, de, a, 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 a what is it a desertification we're creating a desert where there used to be a, a, a rich ecosystem of conversation and ways of being and seeing and um, so this this is really. Like, like I said, this has the potential to give you a way of responding to what's happening at, at the very concrete guts of your life to the horizons of what's happening in the culture. Yep. Yeah. Yep. But I think it's important that the, you know, that there's a, there's sort of a proper paradoxical way of understanding the fact that this has a, this has a, a, a telos that is, aimed to the transcendent, but it also has a modesty. Yes. Modest estimations of its own scope, of its own attention that are properly paired with that transcendent. Well world. said. Yeah, well yeah. said. Well you know, said. Yes, this is experimental. Yes, this, you know, this isn't, this is very much an open-ended exercise. And this is an instance of something that would need to be replicated and reproduced and multiply yeah. in both quality and in quantity in order to be efficacious in the longer term, right? This isn't yeah. like a, you know, um, and, and, and I also think, you know, I, I, I lapse into this refrain often because I think it's very important, but I know you two agree and understand that a lot of what initially draws people to participate in something like this, people come to these things for different reasons and, um, and that's okay. You know, in fact, that makes things, if anything, more interesting. Some people I know participate simply to get a dose of community, to get a dose of communal activity and communal participation that perhaps is otherwise lacking. Goodness knows there isn't a lot of that to go around right now. Mm -hmm. But properly understood, that is not 
the object of this exercise. The fostering of community qua community is not the aim here, right? And that's why this is the ordering of goods into a certain schema, right? And, and the community that is conceived as the, as, the, as the arena for Dialogos is in service of the aims of Dialogos, not in service of itself fundamentally, yes, right? Yes. There, we, have to, we can't confuse the ends and the means when we're talking about the various ingredients that go into the practice. Yes. Well said. Yeah. That's very well said. Yeah. And the, and precisely the, whenever you talk about a practice or an exercise, right. And especially with, with this one, right. With the exercise that we're doing in Dialogos, it's you're doing it. So as, so that you can struggle, right. So that you can exercise and, and put yourself at the optimal edge of your capacity. And, mm -hmm. and, but we're to, and what's really interesting is like a lot of us can understand that through, you know, uh, if you've ever taken sports and you've practiced for an event or something like that, like all of us probably have experiences with kind of practicing and becoming better at something and, and putting our attention on something, right? But when you think about really what, in some sense, just, just um, just showing up and saying on some level that I am I am willing to struggle, right? Because there's something, right, that these exercises afford me and others to get closer to that's inevitably um, inevitably good in itself, in a sense. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I want to just highlight about this is that when I think about everything to do with Dialogos, all of our past conversations, all the ones that I've had on YouTube, all the different, you know, when we've come together, we plan them, all the people that I've met, right, the, and the qualities that, that, that they exhibit, the qualities that I feel are drawn out of me and deepened in relationship with these people, there seems to be like a, it, it's, it's like quite, it feels almost literally true. It's, there's something so good about it, like a mm -hmm. fundamental goodness, right? That it's coming from such a deep place. And I think that the, as, as I'm speaking about this and as we've been talking, you know, there's a certain, to, to, to struggle, right? And as, as Chris highlighted, and he's been a spokesperson for this, and I, I really appreciate in, in this reminder about this, which is some of these things that we'll, we'll be practicing, right, are some of the dip more difficult things for human beings to become good at, right? Like, for example, mm -hmm. profound listening. Like, it's surprising to, 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 for me to recognize how little I even notice that I never listen at a certain degree, right? To, to, to really open up to to how deeply and to really, really hear another person, right? Or hear a new horizon open, right? Those kinds of things are things that one becomes good at through dwelling in it, living in that capacity over and over and over again. And I think one of the things, part of what I think has this feeling of the good that shines through all of it is because ultimately what we're talking about is becoming more intimate with something that is for its own sake, right? Mm -hmm. Re the depth mm -hmm. of reality for its own sake. And I would say one of the things that's really missing in, in I mean, on some level, that's human beings are notoriously struggle with this, but I think in our particular time, in our age of technology, we, without even know it, knowing it, kind of see everything as a means to uh, an end that always exceeds us on some level, right? As, as I'm doing what I'm doing in order to get to this other thing in terms of utility. What we're really talking about, what these practices already kind of presuppose is that what we're going to come into relationship with is, is, a, is a mystery that is for its own sake. And that quality of reverence that shines through it, in my view, seems to evoke, evokes qualities in me that, um, uh, and draws out 
virtues and aspects and develops things in me and has me struggle like with things in myself in such a positive way um, that really it's about, it has that sense of revealing reality as something that's worthy to be in the presence of for its own sake. Yeah, meaning, well, we, uh, the kind of meaning that goes into meaning in life is, I mean, there's several dimensions to it, but one of the key dimensions is a sense of being connected to something that has a reality and a, and a, and a value independent of my existence. Yeah. Um, the bigger picture to be, I want to be connected to something larger, bigger myself. People are using space as a metaphor. Uh, Susan Wolf makes this apparent and the psychological research is pointing to this. We want to connect to something that has a reality independent of us and a value independent of us. Um, and, and that's ultimately why we, we claim to find truth good. Like, ask yourself, why do you, oh, well, I don't believe there's objective value, but you believe that truth is good and what's going on there? Um, and, and it's because somehow truth is about connecting to reality in a way independent of your existence and your personal set of preferences. Um, and that doesn't have to be, though, an impersonal, cold calculation, that connectedness to something other than yourself. I, I, Iris Murdoch famously said, love is when you can really recognize that something other than yourself is real. Yes. 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 Right. Yes. And so Dialogos is about, in that sense, and Chris has been saying it, it's about practicing, proportioning, and calibrating and coordinating your capacity for love, mm -hmm. loving yourself, loving other people, and loving reality. And Dialogos is about that in a proper way. Um, and if you're hungry for meaning, which what the, what the scientific literature and the philosophical tradition both converge on is you want to be connected to something that has an existence and a value independent of your existence and the value you have for yourself. Um, it doesn't try to, to deny them or, or negate them, but it transcends them yeah. in an important way. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. That's right. And there's something so beautifully paradoxical about the fact that that the very way, I mean, this is sort of a Kierkegaardian formulation, but the very way of gaining yourself and the way that you must gain yourself in order to be re-imbued with a sense of vitality and meaning is precisely with the self-sacrifice, precisely yeah. by losing yourself yeah. in and, and losing the kind of egocentrism that we associate with the uncoordinated, chaotic version of those preoccupations yeah. when they're... Yeah buffeting us around and, and directing our attention to places where we know we ought not to put it. And yet we can't help ourselves, but to do it anyway. Right. And so the, 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 the humiliation of oneself subordinated to the higher good and of what is true in the, in the, in the presence of the practice is precisely the avenue by which we seem to uh, regain contact with the part of ourselves that, that, that is, that is ever ahead of us. Right. One of the things that's impressed me from these practice and, and the workshop and other smaller versions I've done in other places is, is people from all different backgrounds, secular or religious, uh -huh. often come out of this talking in spiritual terms, even religious terms, yeah. Uh, yeah. in a way that seems to be um, both natural but also strained for them. Uh, and yeah. uh, I think that's because what they're, what they're trying to understand is a kind of meaning that was for a very long time properly homed within a religious spiritual framework and for many people that's not no longer viable again i'm not criticizing religion i'm just stating a demographic fact huh. and so the fact that both non-religious and religious people start sharing this language together spontaneously we don't introduce it, it just comes up and emerges is also a very powerful and interesting phenomenon and I take it as evidence for what we're talking about here. Yeah. The people are recovering, remembering, and, and recreating all of those terms, uh, that, that capacity for that kind of connectedness, yeah. that yeah. trans-egoic connectedness that we all, um, we all crave. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that we're cultural beings, that we're mammals, uh, that we're moral agents, um, and that these, these have created in us a set of real needs that have to be met by a real relationship 
to reality and, and, and it, it's something that we have to practice just like we have to practice morality. Yeah. Like we, we don't yeah. think that anybody's just sort of innately a, a morally great agent. Yeah. We think, no, no, morality is important. Kids have some innate proclivities perhaps, and then we have to culture it. We have to enculturate it. We have to educate it, right? It's the same thing. It's yeah. the same thing here. Yeah. Same yeah. thing. Because we just we have just as many proclivities for those uh, those behaviors that lead us astray. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And what is something that's so incredible about on a on a on a level that's it's it's odd because you don't normally think about it like this, or people usually don't think or associate this. But there's something really, really uh, when when you start to, one of the things I've noticed, like even in this conversation, there's certain moments where like something was said and it was really insightful and it struck me. It was like, it, it's like reality went, it lit. Mm. There was a deeper understanding, but there is also a, 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 an experience of it revealing what was already somehow present mm -hmm. yeah. or what I was inside yeah, yeah. of. And that sense of that sense of it's almost like a nurturing or this recognition that I'm already held in a world of intelligibility that mm. was maybe concealed to me. But in it being unconcealed, it, I, I don't just learn something new. I recognize something that was pre preceded me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah. that set that quality of. Um, yeah. at home and insight and cultivating insight is is so important it's been so important for me in terms of developing a deeper and deeper sense of trust and having i think a sense about reality not any particular condition or circumstances like transcendent of those things but just the sense of reality having a quality of of a holding of some kind of being held in some deep, deep, rich way. I mean, I have a five month year old um, and I'm, <laughs> I'm constantly having these experiences with him where we have, we have this experience and, and he, like the other day, we, he, he had his first, like you could say, I guess, like existential break. Um, well, we both had it because I had to go get the bottle. He was screaming. And then all of a sudden I heard, while I was in the kitchen, I heard the screaming stop and I heard gunk and I ran out and basically rolled off the couch. Right. And he, he, oh. it was fine, but it scared him. And I picked him up and I was kind of like, I was making sure he's OK. And he and then he got really scared. He just starts screaming. But what was really interesting about this is that his whole being just looked me right in the eye and just started shaking and just he kept like finding home here mm -hmm. and i had this i noticed this impulse of just locking in with him and letting him cry and then feeding him the bottle and he'd scream and then he'd get quiet and he'd scream and then he'd get quiet and we just kept making eye contact and then he started to until this point where he was silent and then he went into this deep sleep for about three hours and it was mom was mom was at like outside outside i was babysitting so i sat in this space at the end of that in silence for like three hours with him and there was something about that silence that i i it it drew forward this sense of this way in which father son family us coming together this this new being coming into the world our holding of him isn't something that we're doing. It's something we're in. And just that he knew to look me right in the eye and I knew to look him right in the eye. And, and the five months of history that we've had each other of that just disclosing and then, and then finding myself just sitting in that silence of this love in this I don't know, knowledge, this insight um, was on some level something that we both dwelled in, right? That's already there. That's already deeply intelligent. And I would say that like, in some senses, my, I would say my ability to notice that and be present to that and to be with that silence and then kind of notice it and be concerned about it and think about it and bring language to it like I'm right doing right now 
like that's all I, all of that for me has been a function of dialogos of circling mm -hmm. of yeah. these kinds yeah. of things, right. Of, of getting together and um, helping each other attune to, and to what is the most meaningful, what is the most profound, right. The livingness of, of it coming into existence and being able to comport and attune to that and have that be the most important thing. All of that, that moment, I would say for me, and the way that we're being a family and the way that that's coming to fruition is so deeply, deeply, deeply um, uh, arises out of these kinds of, out of these conversations, out of, out of dialogos. Socrates would love that guy. Uh, mm -hmm. his, his primary metaphor was to being, being a midwife, helping, helping us give birth to each other, yeah. right? Um, and yeah. Uh, yeah. And then there's no room in that space for the hermeneutics of suspicion, yeah, um, totally. so, which is, uh, yeah. So I think we sort of returned, no pun intended, full circle back to the point uh, yeah. that we started. Um, unfortunately, I, I need to get going. Uh, Absolutely. So, so just to, to uh, and I will, I will put this at the beginning of the video as well through uh, in, in the show notes, but we, our course will be February, um, Saturday and Sunday, February 19th and 20th. It starts at 10 a.m. Um, on both Saturday and Sunday and ends at um, 3.30 p.m. That's 10 a.m. Pacific time. EST, yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Pacific, yeah, California time. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen. This has been wonderful. This has been awesome. Thank you. Thank you both. Bye-bye. Take good care, my beloved Talk friends. to you soon.